Cognitive Psych folks, um, it's Dr. Gilchrist, and I am doing another podcast that you will hopefully have time to listen to uh, on Monday before I come back. Um, I have already put up the study guide for the first exam, which will be on the 25th, so make sure that you take a look at that. Um, so I'm going to finish um, and continue, well, continue rather than finish. We're going to continue discussing uh, visual perception today. We're going to cover a few different things like subliminal perception, pattern recognition, and object recognition. So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover uh, subliminal perception, pattern recognition such as template and feature theories. <coughs> We're going to talk about object recognition. Uh, in particular, we're going to focus on Biederman's recognition by components theory, as well as a few other object recognition theories, as well as disorders of object recognition, and then translating that into face recognition. So I'm going to start by talking about subliminal perception. Is it actually real? And so if you know anything about how psychology occasionally presents itself in popular culture, odds are pretty good you've heard of the Vickery study from 1957. And this is basically the idea that if you briefly flash uh, words like uh, eat popcorn or drink Coca-Cola during a movie, sales of those will both go up. So this was originally uh, discussed by Vickery, who was a movie theater owner in the 1950s. And during a showing of the movie Picnic, he supposedly uh, flashed these in, in different scenes in the movie below somebody's conscious awareness. And it turned out that he reported higher sales of concessions as a result. Um, and like I said, did this during picnics. So here's kind of the idea. The problem with this is that the study and the data were completely made up. And yet, despite all of that, people constantly refer to this particular study as evidence that subliminal perception is real. When in truth, subliminal perception is far more complicated to actually determine. So what does it actually mean to be a subliminal stimulus from the perspective of a cognitive psychologist? Maracle and colleagues back in 2001 reported that there are two different types of thresholds that are involved. You have what is called your subjective uh, threshold, and that is whether or not you report a conscious stimulus. And you have an objective threshold. This is whether or not you can actually perceive it. So there are instances where you perceive something and it actually influences your behavior, but you are not necessarily conscious of it. Now to truly be subliminal, something has to be presented at below the objective threshold where you are not actually perceiving it. But yet, for it to truly be subliminal, it does have to alter behavior in some way. And some people have found evidence that it's real. And this comes from a study by Nakache and colleagues in 2002. So what they did is they presented people with a digit. And people were simply asked, is this digit greater than the number five or is this digit less than the number five? This is a pretty straightforward and very boring task. However, before the conscious a digit that people could actually perceive was presented, participants were presented with a subliminal prime. They were presented with, an, with a first digit that was either congruent with the conscious target or it was incongruent with the conscious target. So here's an example of what I mean. So let's say I presented you with a prime that was two or a subliminal prime that was two, and then I show you the conscious target that is three. Both of those are less than five. The responses do not conflict with each other. So we would consider that a case where the prime is congruent with the target. On the other hand, maybe I briefly flash a seven, and then I present you with a conscious target of four. In this case, the subliminal prime is um, greater than five, but the conscious target is less than five, and those responses will conflict. 
So this is what was really critical. Is the prime that you present first um, congruent or incongruent with the target? And it turns out that participants actually make longer responses when those digits are incongruent. But, so this could give us some evidence for subliminal perception. The problem with this is that these findings are incredibly hard to replicate, and they are also very highly contested. Now, despite the fact that subliminal perception is not actually a thing, not 100% anyway, that doesn't really stop advertisers from trying to put subliminal uh, messages into, the, uh, into their advertisements. Now, here's what's really critical. These different uh, things that you're looking at are not necessarily truly subliminal. It's not that you're not conscious of them, it's that you haven't taken enough time to look at them. So for example, um, supposedly the theory is that they impose images of breasts in ice cubes to get people sexually aroused by drinks. Um, in this particular Absolute Vodka ad, the uh, brand name of Absolute Vodka has been superimposed. The word sex has been superimposed on these ice cubes. And then occasionally I get somebody who tells me that it is subliminal that these two people are sharing a tip over a bowl of salsa in the Tostitos logo. And here's what's really critical about this. This is not truly, um, this is not truly subliminal. If you had enough time to look at this, you would eventually see the two people sharing a chip over a bowl of salsa. If it were truly subliminal, it wouldn't matter how long you looked at it or not, you would not be able to see that at all. So these aren't truly subliminal, they're more like fun little Easter eggs that if you take enough time to look at them, you'll, you'll kind of get the image or the message. So now we're going to move on to talk about pattern recognition. So how do we understand object recognition? So we started out by talking about some of the first steps of visual perception. That includes determining where the edges of an object are, um, using object features to help and uh, remember object knowledge to help us figure out where an object is and how to separate it from its background. And we also uh, looked at two-dimensional patterns to help us understand object recognition. Now, one of the things that you'll discover when we talk about pattern recognition is that most of this research is done with letters. Letters are fairly simple, uncomplicated patterns that most English speaking participants understand. So it makes it very easy to do research with the stimuli. So one of the earliest theories of pattern recognition was something known as template theory, which is basically the idea that we have a stored template for each possible visual pattern that we could see out in the world. And so when we're trying to figure out what something is, we search through all of the stored templates that we have in our mind to try to find a match. The one that's the closest match ends up winning. However, there's a problem with template matching. So the idea is that if I look at a letter A in a particular font, I must therefore have a, a template for A in every single font, every single size, every single orientation. And really, one of the things that's interesting about this, so here I'm presenting you with all of these different letter A's. Each of them is in a different font. According to template theory, you have a template for each one of these, which would mean that for you to figure out that there's an A, you would have to store thousands of templates, maybe even hundreds of thousands of templates to compensate for the fact that you can be looking at differences in size, font, color, etc. And one of the things you'll see is that we can very easily identify the letter A from these without having to search through a very unwieldy set of templates. Our visual system is incredibly flexible. For template theory to be true, we would need a template for every single possible instance that we saw. So we tend to ascribe to what are known as feature theories. Patterns can be considered a set of features or attributes. So 
So focusing on the features rather than looking at a very specific way that something is presented actually permits flexibility. So if I'm trying to judge whether or not something is an A, I don't have to focus on a particular template. I can focus on the three different lines that are involved and the relationships between them. Now, some of the major assumptions of feature theories is to process specific local features before we process global ones. Now, here is some potential evidence for these feature theories. So I want you, obviously we're not in class, but I'm going to show you two different lists. And I want you to focus on when you see the letter Z. So I'm going to give you the first list right now. Okay, were you able to find the Z? Hopefully you have at this point. Now I'm going to show you the second list. Were you able to find the Z? Now odds are pretty good that compared between the first list and the second list, here's the Z in the second list, here's the Z in the first list. So they're in the exact same place, but odds are pretty good this Z was much harder to find than this one. So what you'll notice is that in this list, uh, list two, we're looking at very rounded figures. We're looking at O's, we're looking at D's, U's, G's, Q's, R's, things that have curves. On the other hand, if you take a look at list one, we have a lot of diagonal lines as well as horizontal lines. And those are features that a Z has. And that makes the Z here harder to distinguish than the Z here when it's surrounded by letters with a lot of curvature. So hopefully list two was a little bit easier for you. And this is based on work by Ulrich Nieser. This is basically the finding that visual search for particular, a particular item is faster when the target shares fewer features with that list. So the feature theory basically says that we start with local features and then we process global features. But other researchers have found that we sometimes do process global features first. So what you're looking at here is what is referred to as a maven figure. This is a case where we have a particular letter made out of smaller letters. So we have an overall global pattern, in this case the letter H, and we also have our local pattern. This is uh, made up of S's. So Maven presented figures like two participants. And he actually found that in general, we tend to focus on the global letter before we focus on the smaller letters that make it up. So odds were pretty good that you actually noticed that this was an H before you noticed that it was made of smaller S's. And one of the things you'll notice, this is what is referred to as an incongruent figure. So we have um, one letter being made up of completely different letters. So we have an H made out of S's. So this is a case where the local features are incongruent with the global features. Evidence shows that when a figure is congruent or incongruent, we take an equal amount of time to process the global letter. It doesn't take as much work. But when we're asked to identify the local features, it actually becomes harder for us to do when this is incongruent. So Maven actually provided evidence for sometimes utilizing global features before looking at local ones when we're trying to identify patterns. And we also know that attention really helps us play a role. So what you're looking at here is a study by Dalrymple and colleagues in 2009 where we're using these Naven figures, but we're basically either tightly packing letters together or we're spacing them out more. And we're also modifying the size of the letters that are being made. Dalrymple actually found that global processing takes more time when the local features are larger, like they are here, and they're more spread out. So in particular, this F is gonna be harder to identify than any other F. So it really depends on the relationship between the local and the global features to figure out which we're going to identify first. 